Well, hello, everyone. I am here with the legend himself, Mr. Michael Johnson. No, not the famous Olympian who won many, many gold medals, but almost as good as that. Almost, almost. almost yeah, <laughs> he's, he's strong in the Lord. Um, today, or this, uh, this you know, next few months, we'll be talking about relational issues, um, marriage, dating, singleness, divorce, all the above, um, some big topics. So we wanted to dig in today with the foundational question, which is really, why is marriage so important? Why, why is marriage so important? That's what we're talking about today. I mean, it's something super important to talk about. I mean, it's a huge topic in our world today. Just the, the culture is battling over this. There's people arguing that marriage needs to be between men and women. It needs to be right. It needs to be the way it's been held traditionally. But there's also a lot of pressure that it should be changed. It should be shifted to meet uh, differing standards. Yeah. Of, ever changing. Yeah. <laughs> ever developing standards. Yeah. And it's funny because people on both sides, you know, ask the question like, why do you care so much? So if you're conservative and you say marriage between a man and a woman, that's it. Like we're not going to change that. The question is who cares? Why do you care so much? Why are you so obsessed with marriage? And then the other side could ask the same question, right? Conservatives right. could ask liberals, why can't you just, you know, do what you want to do. It's not illegal to be with who we want to be with. But why do you have to change the definition of marriage? Right. And I think both sides understand that marriage is very important. So this is a hot issue. Um, I know I've heard many people say, well, marriage is just a piece of paper. Who even cares? Right. So there's that the ideas of we should change it or we should keep it the same. But there's also the idea of like it's irrelevant, you know, and um yeah, it, I mean, it's not just a piece of paper. I guess it's just a piece of paper in the same sense that your employment is just a employment contract or legislation is just a piece of paper. But these things have massive implications for how people live, right? I mean, right. the world is changed every day by a few words on a piece of paper that are passed into law. So, yeah, these things these things matter. So, why is marriage so important? That's our question for today. Because it is. It is very important. So, let's look at a few things. The first reason we see in scripture as to why marriage is so important is because of its origin, because of its origin. Marriage was given by God and at creation. So it's, its origin is not from humans and it's not after the fall of man. It's a good gift by God given at the very beginning. So it's his invention and um, it's not just some necessary evil is what this, this shows us. Okay, so because of, because of that, it's a fundamental aspect of what it means to be human, right? Marriage is foundational to humanity. Now, of course, I'm not saying you're less if you're not married. That would be crazy because Jesus himself was never married, right? right. And I would say he lived a pretty good life, right? Would he you would, say? One might say perfect. Top top one <laughs> top person, one. <laughs> the yeah. goat, the goat of all humanity. Um so Jesus himself, when he's teaching on creation, he comes back, when well, on marriage, he comes back to the creation story. In Matthew 19, um, which we'll look at a little bit later, but in Matthew 19, he goes directly to, okay, what did God do from the beginning? So marriage is defined the same way it's been defined from Genesis chapter 2. So that's super important. The origin shows us why these things, why marriage is so important. So there are many things that were invented by humans, but marriage isn't one of them. So we don't have a right to define it however we want to define it. Yeah, I mean, that's such an important point to emphasize, too, in the context of the culture wars of today where people are saying, uh, let's change marriage to be more inclusive of di people's differing lifestyles. Um, but if we realize that God is the one who made marriage, he invented it, then it's not something that we have the right to change. Yeah. And so that's why we need to basically fight to make it right according to how God defined it originally, rather than making yeah. it something of our own. That's good, yeah. Yeah, because we're, it, there, are, there are many reasons to, to say marriage is a man and a woman, and that's it. It can't be anything else. Um, for us as Christians, we can be honest and say foundationally, yes, Scripture is the main reason for that. It's that there is a God, that despite what we want to believe. There, God is real. He defines reality, and he says marriage is male and female, together for life, right, in a covenant of marriage. So there are other reasons that are, I think are very compelling. I think you could get to we shouldn't have other forms of marriage, quote unquote, mm -hmm. um, than just what the Bible defines as marriage without scripture, because you could say, well, look at how children are reared, things like that. Right. But it's not a bad thing to say, yes, there's a God, and yes, 
he knows better than we do. Absolutely. That's, that's a, an important thing. So, so one reason why marriage is so important is its origin. It's created by God at creation. Second, there are many reasons related to the purpose of marriage. So origin is one thing. Where does it come from? That helps us to understand how we should approach it. But also, what is its purpose as defined by God? So there's a few different things we can see about the pur- purpose of marriage. And we could probably add on to this list, too. This is not an exhaustive list. Yeah. But one is marriage exalts male and female. Marriage shows us what it means to be man and woman. And this is something, again, that's very lost in our culture. And it's no surprise to anyone who's a student of Scripture that when marriage is redefined, that male and female becomes redefined slowly, right? Or very, very rapidly <laughs> in the case of our culture. Yeah. So look at Genesis chapter 2. This is where we got to start, right? Because Genesis chapter 2, starting in verse 18, shows us the first wedding ceremony, and it becomes a foundation for all other types of marriage. Again, and I'm just taking this as to how Jesus himself uses it in Matthew 19. He refers back to this, and this defines what marriage is. Or Paul in Ephesians 5, which we'll see later. He comes back to this passage. So we have to study and see what it says. So Genesis 2.18, God has created all of the creatures, created the entire creation, but he says in Genesis 2.18, it is not good that the man should be alone. So this is an amazing statement. It's the first time in, in the creation account that we hear God say something is not good. So after each act of creation, as you know, God says, it is good, it is good, it is good. And then it is very good. And here he says, it is not good. So this is so jarring to us that we have to take notice of this if we're reading reading this text. So what is it that's not good? It's not good for the man to be alone. It's not good for man to be without woman. So this shows us that community is important. That's one thing it shows us, but also it shows us that male and female together are are necessary to to show the full image of God. So what is the solution? God says, I will make him a helper fit for him. So the the idea there of a helper fit for him, well, the word helper, uh, sorry, I should should back up. There's a lot of things we could see here. Um, There's there's the complementary nature of male and female. So the idea of being fit for him is that they are alike and different. There's actually two words in the Hebrew, like and different. So this is something that has certain similarities and certain differences. So male and female are alike largely, right? The, the similarities between male and female are greater than the differences. We have very similar, you know, we have the same amount of fingers and toes and all that sort of stuff, but there are also significant differences. And she's meant to be a helper, which is this word in Hebrew that refers to often military reinforcements. So this is somebody who's not just a lesser person to do whatever you want them to do, right? God himself is called a helper in the Old Testament. Mm -hmm. Again, as you know, he's a student of scripture that you are. Um, But it refers to someone who comes along to strengthen you and to complete what is lacking in you. So male and female are meant to be complementary. And then when we see as we go on here, verse 19, now out of the ground, the Lord God had formed every beast of the field and every bird of the heavens and brought them to the man to see what he would call them. And whatever the man called every living creature, that was its name. The man gave names to all livestock and to the birds of the heavens and every beast of the field. But for Adam, there was not found a helper fit for him. So same phrasing as verse 18, helper fit for him. So the Lord God caused a deep sleep to fall upon the man. And while he slept, took one of his ribs and closed up its place with flesh and the rib the Lord God had taken from the man, he made into a woman and brought her to the man. It's interesting, even in verse 22, the verb there for making the woman is a different word. So the, the, the verb is more like he built the woman. Mm. So with Adam, he's, he made him, he formed him out of the dust. Right. Woman was built from the rib of man. So even in the creation account, there are very different ways in which humans are created. There's different materials right? Dust versus a rib or part of the body. And there's different verbs as well. And all of this is just more and more indications that there is something very different about male and female, something very beautiful and different. So God uses different materials, different methods to show that man and woman are different by design. It's not accidental. 
And and it's amazing because the world has completely lost any definition of male and female. Absolutely. Right? <laughs> As you see this just last, I think it was last week or two weeks ago, the uh, the Cambridge Dictionary changed their definition of woman. Oh, boy. Did you see this? <laughs> I, I don't know if you it, saw this yeah. online. It was trending. So the definition used to just be an adult female human okay. woman. Got so it. they changed it to this, or they added on a second definition, um, which totally negates the first definition. They said, this is a quote, an adult who lives and identifies as female, though they may have been said to have a different sex at birth. So <laughs> someone who lives and identifies as female. So in other words, if you believe yourself to be a woman, even if reality says differently, then you are a woman. You know, And so this is, and again, if maybe, maybe you've followed this kind of development of the transgender movement a lot. Maybe you haven't. Maybe you think, oh, these conservatives are freaking out. What's the big deal? That's a pretty crazy thing to change something so fundamental, a word so fundamental to what it means to be human Absolutely. as man yeah. or woman. Um, but our world is extremely confused on this point, to say the least, right? <laughs> <laughs> you could say that. <laughs> <laughs> That's a crazy thing. But again, if you turn away from marriage, you turn away from much of what gives beauty to male and female. This is a display. Marriage is meant to be a display of the beauty of God's creation in male and female. So the Bible gives us an alternative to debasing women in this way by erasing what it means to be human. There's a much better alternative, right? You don't have to be abusive to women or demean women, and you don't have to erase women. You can actually embrace the beauty of the differences between male and female, celebrate that, and express it in marriage. It's a beautiful thing. And many people have yeah. over the years said, wait a second, everything I was told growing up about how it's terrible to be feminine is not true. It's actually a good thing, right? And even just, again, the creation, the way God creates, Matthew Henry said it this way, and it's a very famous quote, but he said that woman was made, was not made out of his head, out of man's head to top him, nor out of his feet to be trampled upon by him, but out of his side to be equal with him, under his arm to be protected, and near his heart to be loved. So God creates male and female in this way so that they are equal, but distinct and different. And both of those things are very important. So marriage is about male and female coming together as one because man and woman need each other. What a radical thing that is to say wow. in the year 2023. <laughs> <laughs> that's, it's truly amazing. Uh, so that's the first thing uh, in terms of the, the purposes of marriage is that marriage is meant to display the beauty of man and woman. Second thing, though, is that marriage is the foundation of the family. Marriage is meant to be the foundation of the family. So... Again, very basic things that should never need to be said, but we wouldn't have people without the union of men and women together in marriage, right? Or at least in, in a sexual relationship. But we need more than just a, this conjugal union of people. We need more than just a, a sexual relationships to, to create healthy children. We need, we need marriages, right? We need a home. We need a family. That's what gives a foundation for the flourishing of children. And we need people that are committed to each other. We need a mom and a dad, both investing in the life of their kids. And if a home is missing, either a mom or a dad, they're missing something of such significance that it's, it's very, very difficult to make up for it, right? right. Like if you, don't, if you were raised without a mom or a dad, then you were robbed of something that is so fundamental, right? Now, I'm not saying at all that you can't be healthy, you can't be whole without a mom or a dad. Mm -hmm. But it's, it's, like, it's like saying I'm missing a leg. No, you can be a fully functional, happy human being without a leg. But that is a tragic circumstance that it shouldn't be that way. Right. Right. So I'm not saying you're less than. I'm just saying this is not the ideal. This is not helpful. This is not what we want to see happen if we can avoid it. So marriage provides this this beautiful union of male and female so that a child is brought into the world in safety and with a, a great example, Lord willing, right, of what it means to be a man and what it means to be a woman. Right. And that is so formative. The stats on single parent households I was are say that. staggering. Yeah. Right? I mean, the, the increase in crime, in you know, dropping out of high school, in uh, pregnancy outside of marriage, if you go down the list of different things, it is a, sh a shocking increase. It's yeah. shocking, I guess, to anyone who hasn't read the Bible. Mm -hmm. If you read the Bible, you understand that you need a, a strong marriage um, to raise kids. Yeah. That's the ideal. And if you don't, like if you're here and you're a single parent, you're listening to this, well, you need a community around you, right? You, you even more, 
Everyone needs this, but you even more need the church to be around you to help you to make up for what is naturally lacking. It won't help right. at all if you say, I don't want to listen to this. I'm, everything is great the way it is. No, you may not have chosen this situation, or you may have sinned and not repented of it, but you can find community and you can find ways to compensate for that. Right. But it is a, it is a lack. Yeah, I mean, there's a clear difference just in the compliment, the complementarity of men and women that a mother and a father have different things going for them that children need. And yeah. so if you only have one of those, uh, it needs to get filled in <laughs> because yeah. there's going to be things lacking there. Absolutely. Absolutely. So marriage provides this foundation for family, for raising children. And the, the next thing is that marriage exalts love. We, we don't want to overlook this because it is very important. Um, marriage exalts love. Now, um, most people in your life, you'll have seasons where you're closer to them or farther away, right? The average friendship lasts for seven years is what I've heard. But with marriage, you have someone who you're committed to for life. Um, you know, w even with kids, you have this season of sacrifice, maybe 18 years for some people. Maybe they're with you for 40, 45, you know, <laughs> I, I don't know. I don't want to, to brag and say I'm going to, you know, do better than that. I hope not. <laughs> But with marriage, you don't ever move past that, right? You're always with them, sacrificing for life. And so this exalts love, this exalts commitment. It's, it's so important and so foundational for the rest of life as well. You need that relationship that you're committed to strongly. And in Genesis 2, when, when Adam encounters his new wife, he responds with poetry, right? He responds with love. Of course, he's, he's going to be committed to her, but he also is mesmerized by this woman. He, he, he finds her you know, beauty compelling. He's drawn to her. And the Bible spends a good amount of time exalting marriage love. There's a whole book devoted to it, right? Song of Solomon. Mm -hmm. That's an amazing thing that God would write an entire book about marriage love. So this is not a, a small thing. Love is an important aspect of who God is. And it and in our lives, we have this marriage relationship to point to that. Right. I mean, First John 4 says God is love. Yeah. And so if you don't love, then you don't know God. And so yeah. that's something that's, that's right. so, so critical. Yeah, it's actually a wrong speaking for me to say that love is an aspect of who God is. Mm -hmm. Love, I mean, love embodies who God is. So it's so important for us to grow in that. And then the next thing is that marriage is designed to grow individuals. This could be, you know, overlooked. Maybe it seems like an obvious point to some, but... If you're living with someone who's different than you, they're going to stretch you. They're going to challenge you. They're going to see blind spots in your life that you don't see. And so marriage helps us to grow to be the kind of person that God wants us to be. So, And one of the best ways you can grow in your life is by staying married, even when it's difficult. Stay married. Say, I'm going to do what God calls me to do, even when it's hard. You know, There are very few exceptions for divorce, which we'll talk about at some later date, but the general idea is you stay in marriage, you stay committed even when it is very, very difficult because that's going to grow you. And then the last thing is really, I kind of save the best for last, the most important reason mm -hmm. why marriage is so important. It's not just some sort of temporary benefit or even spiritual growth, which is a big thing. It's something even, even better, which is that there's an eternal aspect to marriage. Marriage is meant to point to the gospel of Jesus Christ. We like that word gospel, obviously. A good one. We use it maybe too much. I don't know. <laughs> but, <laughs> but the gospel is the good news of Jesus, right? So marriage is meant to be a picture of that good news. Now, let me kind of just unpack this a little bit, I guess. Um, we know that individual marriages don't last beyond this life, right? In Matthew 22, 30, Jesus is clear that in the resurrection, people aren't married or given in marriage but we're like the angels in heaven. Right. So um, we do not have marriage in eternity. So marriage is a temporary way in this lifetime to point to something of eternal significance. It's a pointer. It's a sign of something bigger. And Jesus in his ministry focused a lot on marriage. Obviously, we, we saw at the beginning of the Bible that marriage is prominent, right? So in the very beginning, the Bible starts with a wedding, the, the miracles of Jesus, the first miracle of Jesus was at a wedding. So it's in John chapter 2. John chapter 1 starts a lot like Genesis chapter 1, mm -hmm. right? In the beginning, right, was the word. It echoes Genesis 1. And in John 2, 
Jesus's first miracle is supposed to, I believe, echo the first wedding in Genesis chapter two. So Jesus comes along, he blesses a wedding by making a bunch of wine, right? By turning water into wine, but it's at a wedding. So this is God in the flesh, right? As Christ blessing the, this marriage, blessing this. And we don't know who got married, but it seems insignificant, right? The whole idea is God is coming to bless his creation. And so marriage is a focus of that. So this is not incidental. This is very important. And Jesus is pointing back to what God has done. He's pointing to the present that he is God. And he's pointing to the future when there will be this final wedding ceremony. He's pointing to what his, his ministry is going to be about. His ministry, the ministry of Christ, is about marriage in a real sense. It's about marriage. Now, let's look at Ephesians chapter 5 because this just helps bring so much of this together. And again here, Paul is going to is going to quote at the end from Genesis chapter 2. So we'll go back to that. So in Ephesians chapter 5, starting verse 22, we see these encouragements to wives and to husbands. So first we see, we see a few different references to the church, right? So in verse 23, we see the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church. In verse 24, it says, Now as the church submits to Christ, so also wives should submit in everything to their husbands. And then in verse 25, husbands love your wife as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her. Um, in v- verse 27, so that he might present the church to himself in splendor. In verse 29, right, no one ever hated his own flesh, but nourishes and cherishes it just as Christ does the church. So there's, a, there's so many references to Christ and the church as Paul is talking about man and woman in marriage. So he keeps expanding and looking at something that is bigger than just two people in this temporary life. Mm-hmm. He, sent, he's, he keeps redirecting and saying, Christ, church, Christ, church. And then in verse 31, he quotes from Genesis chapter 2. He says, Therefore a man shall leave his father and mother and hold fast to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. This mystery is profound, and I am saying that it refers to Christ and the church. So in case you missed the first five times he was saying it, right? Got he makes it so explicit <laughs> here. He's saying there's a mystery in this command of marriage. And he's saying the mystery is that it is referring to Christ in the church. So marriage is not about just a man and a woman. When I, when I officiate a wedding ceremony, which is one of the best things in the world to do, I love doing that, I, I always have to think about Christ and his church. Mm-hmm. This, this story that has been going on through all of history of God pursuing his bride, pursuing those he loves, and sacrificing for them, and how this marriage, this temporary marriage, is meant to point people to that, mm-hmm. to say there's a story beyond this. There's a reason why we all love seeing two people in love. We love you know, um, wedding ceremonies. We love celebrating that. It's because there's something greater that's coming. So Jesus Christ, in his own life, he sacrifices himself for his, his body, right? For his church, for his bride. And um, Jesus came to rescue this bride by the sacrifice of himself for them, right? So he pays the price for, for our sins. He, he gives to us, he imputes to us his own righteousness. And then when he's resurrected, we are raised with him to a new kind of life mm-hmm. so that we can be washed pure so on that final day, there will be a, a ceremony, a wedding ceremony between God and his people. In other words, we're meant to be with God forever. And so God gives to us this temporary picture called marriage, the best relationship that you could possibly have when it's done right, to point us to that we need something better. There's a reason why every marriage disappoints at some level. You know, I, I mean, I love my wife, but we're, we're not perfect. We have disagreements. We have challenges. And it's meant to remind us that that we're not the end for each other. Yeah. That it's just to point us to our ultimate desire to be with God forever. And so the story of the Bible not only begins with a, we- a wedding, and not only the ministry of Christ that begins with a wedding, but the Bible ends with a wedding as well. All right, Revelation chapter 19, we see that the that in verse nine, or sorry, chapter 19, verse 7, it says, Let us rejoice and exult and give. God, the glory for the marriage of the Lamb has come, and his bride has made herself ready. It was granted her to clothe herself with fine linen, bright and pure, for the fine linen is the righteous deeds of the saints. 
So the final day, it, we see a picture of God and his people coming together in perfect harmony, in unity forever, to be together, and for God to pour out his blessings on his people. So marriage is important for temporal reasons mm-hmm. and eternal reasons. Yep. That's why we care so much about marriage. And however you, you engage in the, the quote-unquote culture wars is just a secondary thing to rem- remembering what marriage is all about. This is a sacred gift from God. It was made by him, and it was made for many purposes, but most of all, to show us about who he is and about the entire story of the world. God pursuing his people in love to rescue them and to bring them home one day. Yeah, I mean, it's it's a blessing worth pursuing. It's not just an old tradition that's passing away, as some people are also saying in, yeah. in our culture as well. So. That's right. So go and be married well, I guess. Uh, if you're married, <laughs> rejoice in that, right? Be be Christ. If you're the husband, be Christ as Christ is to the church. If you're not married, um, wait on that, right? Wait on that. If you, if you desire that, then trust in God. He's going to provide at the right time. And uh, remember what it's all about. It's about Christ. Thanks so much for watching. If you appreciate this video, make sure you like, comment, and most of all, subscribe to this channel to get more great biblical content every single week. Also, check out our catalog of videos on all different topics that will help you in your study of God's Word. And if you want to support this ministry, help get the Word out, you can support us financially with a link down in the description below. Thank you.